Hello, my name's Amanda Edmiston and I'm a professional storyteller with a background in herbal medicine. I'm based up in Scotland and usually I work across the UK and I'm fortunate enough occasionally to work internationally as well. Um, but I'm joining you today from my home um, up near Stirling and um, I'm delighted to have been invited to bring my latest project, uh, The Very Curious Herbal, to Chawton House's Virtual Garden Festival this weekend. The project um, is inspired by the work of an incredible, pioneering Scotswoman, Elizabeth Blackwell. She was born around 1707 in the same town I was born in, Aberdeen. Now, for those of you who don't know Aberdeen, it's a city that's always had a, an air of rebelliousness. It's um, very good at adapting to the twists and turns life offers it. It's a, a city that's got a history of innovation, of coming up with new ideas and intriguing ways to adapt to new information. A lot of people believe that this is because, as a, as a city up on the northeast coast of Scotland, it's always had a huge array of travellers and sailors from other places bringing with them new ideas, and the city has, has learnt from this. So, Elizabeth Blackery, the, the woman I'm introducing you to in this first session, um, was born about 270 years before my arrival in the city's Forrester Hill Maternity Hospital. And the Aberdeen of those days, a granite-graced, silver city, was already a place of innovation. Except in those days, the uh, innovative ideas ran to the somewhat more prosaic. Um, street lighting had just been introduced and road sweeping and uh, letting up on the previous century and a half of witch burning. Probably just in time to give themselves to build up the energy to become the heartland of the Jacobite Rebellion. But more of that later on. I first met Elizabeth in the hallowed environs of the beautiful wood panelled library in the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow. I was creating a project for them and I opened up the lignin soft pages of this book first published in 1737, an original copy and was captivated by her meticulous and um, very lifelike representation of larch, complete with the bracket fungi that grows on larch. Larch is quite an important um, plant at this point in my project and my um, engagement with her work because Larch as a, as a batch flower remedy is very useful for helping people of all sorts, but particularly creative people have the confidence in their work. It helps you reassure you at an emotional level that your work is as good as anybody else's. And as I started to find out more about Elizabeth Blackwell's story, the more profound her drawing of Larch seemed. This was a woman who clearly did have confidence in the face of some quite, probably frightening, circumstances. And I started to uncover more about her. Whilst the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in Glasgow knows all about Elizabeth Blackwell, as she was by then, Nowhere on any on any list, uh, honorary or otherwise, is the name of a by then husband, Alexander Blackwell, with whom our Elizabeth eloped. Um, after his medical credentials were called into question, 
The couple, in the face of shame amongst the society of Aberdeen, uh, Elizabeth was the daughter of a wealthy stocking merchant, eloped to London. And, and there, Elizabeth set her husband up in printing business. Now, several people have asked along the way about my use of the words she set him up in the printing business. It's important to remember that Scottish women were not covered by the law of coverture in the same way the English women were. So uh, her belongings did not immediately become her husband's on marriage. And I imagine that the forward-thinking Blackwells maybe kept hold of this essential part of the way they've been brought up. Unfortunately, blacker that Alexander was, it wasn't long, it has to be said, before he was once again in a slightly sticky situation. His reputation was once again in tatters. He found himself in huge amounts of debt and discredited by the printers and uh, publishers of London found himself in a Highgate debtors jail. Elizabeth was on her own with her young son, penniless and in a situation where many of us would be forgiven for maybe returning home and going back to our parents, she took a different course. In days when middle-class women did not work for a living, she took to walking from her home in nearby Chelsea down towards the embankment to Chelsea Physic Garden and studying the plants there. I imagine her taking her son's hand as the pair walked along to the beautiful walled garden and sharing stories of her own childhood with the young boy harking back to her days in Aberdeen when with her mother and her sister she might have walked on the Pole Moor, a then wind-clovered landscape leading down to the River Dee. The same place I played as a child with my grandfather, my mother, my grandmother, learning about the plants as we walked in what was by then Duthie Park. In Elizabeth's day, this was a wild landscape, and I imagine that maybe she learnt a little about the dandelion and the cleavers that grew amongst the gorse. Maybe she took that story she heard told by her mother to her and her sisters to her young son as they walked through Chelsea telling him how it was said that the yellow dandelions poking their head up between the paving stones were believed by many to have once been the fairy folk that were said to live across Scotland. How that, that plant, so good for our digestive systems with its bitter taste, the leaves then popular in salads, were said to have once been fairies, but the more people had populated our land, the less they had seen the fairy folk clad in their traditional green and low to the ground, and had trodden them underfoot. The fairies had made the decision to then take up dressing themselves in bright yellow garb, and unfortunately, although the yellow caught our eye and beckoned us in, we still forgot the magic inherent in those wee folk and they became just dandelions, their seeds blowing off in the wind, the puff of a fairy clock reminding us of their origins. I imagine her young son, intrigued by his mother's stories, shared from her own childhood. I imagine how amazing Chelsea Physic Garden would have seemed to the pair with its beautiful exotic plants collected from around the world by Sir Hans Sloane. Sir Hans 
became the friend of Elizabeth. And he, along with the then director of Chelsea Physic Garden, Isaac Rand, and the head gardener, Philip Miller, were intrigued and very pleased by Elizabeth's suggestion that what she could do was create a whole new herbal. One the ilk of which had never happened before. One that drew not only those dandelions and cleavers, the trees native to this land that we would pass every day, but also these new plants that Sir Hans and other plant collectors had brought into the country. Plants that were very rarely seen by anyone outside of the elite. Elizabeth suggested that she create herbal with 500 cups of the plants commonly used for the purpose of physic, drawing the plants from life from the garden and from collections from across Europe. With the seal of approval from Sir Hans Sloan, who not only was a plant collector and had travelled widely across the Americas, but was um, a very uh, well-respected doctor. Um, she also had the backing of the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries, who rented Chelsea Physic Garden from Sir Hans Sloan at a peppercorn rent, and still do to this day. Um, so she had an awful lot of support and we can't undervalue enough, uh, I can't value enough, do excuse me, there's nothing like a live event, um, we can't really uh, overestimate how incredible this support would have been. It was very, very unusual, even uh, 10 years after Elizabeth had died in the 1760s, women Botanists were disguising themselves as men to further explore their field. As late as the 1790s, uh, the, Reverend, the Reverend Polwell was expressing horror for women studying botany. Elizabeth was creating work 60 years before he expressed concern at the notion of boys and girls botanising together, thinking it unseemly for women to study natural history. So, although we think of her as this uh, drawer of, of plants, of her recording something beautiful but quite elegant and maybe quite polite for a middle-class woman to be doing, this is not polite. This is not um, an ordinary thing for a woman of her class to be doing as early as this. It's a really, really significant step to take. She goes on to become the first woman to publish a herbal. Now, I always think it's rather interesting that we use the words the first woman to publish a herbal because I think there is a risk we underestimate quite what an amazing step she took. Just a few years before, the bulk of the herbals still had plants that weren't drawn from life. Elizabeth Blackwell drew her plants with a degree of accuracy that e enables us even today to take the pictures from her book and recognise plants we might not normally know purely from the detail in her illustration alone. If you think 200 years before, the Hortus, which many of you will be familiar with, um, was still portraying mandrake, for example, as an anatomically correct man-shaped root that still rested on its reputation to emit a deadly scream when it was foisted from the earth. Elizabeth draws mandrake with a degree of accuracy that would let us recognise it, even if we'd never met the plant before. And this is, is quite an astounding step. The other thing that's often said about Elizabeth Blackwell is that she then, having drawn the plants from life in Chelsea Physic Garden, took 
the work in to her husband in Highgate Debtors Jail and he wrote the words. Now, Alexander Blackwell might have been a bit of a blagger, but he did have a reputation for being good with languages. He was the son of um, the Dean of Marshall College in Aberdeen, one of the, you know, the earliest colleges of one of the oldest universities in Britain. However, I don't think for one moment that Alexander wrote all the words four plants a week for her to publish episodically from the discomfort of his jail cell. I imagine that Elizabeth, with her access to one of the finest physic gardens in the world, with the ear of famous plant collectors, eminent gardeners, brilliant apothecaries, and a library of books at her fingertips, many of which she references throughout her work, work by Culpepper and Gerard. I don't think that Alexander Blackwell wrote the words with no knowledge, no work, no work in front of him. I think that this is a small deception on the Blackwell's part in order to have the book accepted more widely. I think that our Elizabeth, a very capable, determined woman who clearly was able to learn and ingest information, who became friends with Sir Hans and Lady Sloane, who's respected by these people. I think Elizabeth wrote the words herself. I also think that We've constantly told that all this work was done from the plants at Chelsea Physic Garden. But as I've read the book more carefully, I've started to see that some of the plants came from other places. There are samples given to her by gardeners at Leiden University, one of the leading medical colleges in Europe at the time. There are plants from all over the place. This is clearly a woman who is engaging with things that are deep, an intelligent level. Now I mentioned briefly there another facet of this incredible publication. Elizabeth is writing, as I mentioned, between the, uh, just at the end of the witch trials. Uh, the last witch in Aberdeen is burnt in the first few years of her childhood. The medical establishment is, is just building itself up. We're beginning to require that our doctors and physicians are qualified and and um, watched more carefully in detail so that they provide a more thorough and even service. But along with that, and the shift and struggle in power um, is the loss of a degree of information. The common knowledge of how to use plants like dandelion turned to as a great digestive stimulant with its bitter qualities and its potassium rich ability to to lower blood pressure um cleavers with their incredible uh, knack of cleansing the lymph um something that they're still used for in western med western herbal traditions today um and at the time, still sold in markets as a vegetable. Um, this would have been widespread knowledge. In fact, the uh, gentleman's journal towards the end of the 18th century remarks that this is uh, the knowledge of Cleaver's ability to, hear, to heal uh, skin conditions um, is, is uh, a little uh, lower class. It's not very well thought of. The uh, the writer comments that um, renowned doctors probably will scorn him for mentioning it because this is the knowledge of everyday people and that knowledge is being shifted. There is a degree of, of, of discrediting going on. Not only are people being burnt as witches for a variety of reasons, but also... Um, we are requiring our doctors to be better regulated. This is a good thing in many ways. Also new plants are coming in. New remedies are being found from countries around the world. And Elizabeth does something incredible. She releases 
her publication episodically, making plants that may only be available to the elite in hallowed physic gardens available at an affordable level. Now, people often remark that this is to give her a regular income, but it also makes it accessible to a far wider number of people. Elizabeth's publication is successful. She's given the seal of approval by the Worshipful Society of Apothecaries and the Royal College of Physicians, and she raises enough money to have her husband released from a debtor's jail. Unfortunately, I almost hear a sigh and shrug as uh, her husband announces he's found a, a new post as agricultural advisor to the King of Sweden. She was setting off to join him, but, um, well, she got the news just before she left that he'd been caught up in a possibly Jacobite plot to alter somewhat the dynasty of uh, Sweden. He was caught up in a, in a plot to overthrow the crown and promptly executed. Our Elizabeth found herself alone and not very much is known about the last 10 years or so of her life. I hope she kept wandering through Chelsea Physic Garden and I've got a few more insights that I'll share with you in the next couple of sessions. An idea or two about what else Elizabeth might have done. But um, uh, what I do know is that she's still a very important person. She's been undervalued for a very long time. I also crossed her path at another point. I first started my career as a herbal storyteller, walking along the paths of Chelsea Physic Garden, finding out and sharing stories and legends from around the world about the plants that grew there. And along with a few more bits about our Elizabeth, I'll be sharing some of those legends about the plants and how they're used in another couple of sessions later on. But thank you all very much for joining me and um, have a wonderful day. And I hope you're safe and enjoying a garden somewhere and I'll catch you all later. Thank you.